and welcome in to this week's edition of Broadcaster Hour. I'm Roger Hoover, joining you from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. On the other side of the screen, we've got Kyle Crooks, and in the center of the screen, someone that's called way more SEC soccer than even Kyle and I have called. That is Mike Watts. Mike, it's great to see you. How's everything going? Yeah, it's good to be with some people who, who know the SEC soccer scene, so that's a start. Uh, good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's good to see you, Mike. It's been a little bit, and so you got the beard going and all that, but it's it's been a, a crazy kind of a few months for you. Starting in the summer, you were the busiest guy during the summer months of the quarantine because you were quarantined with NWSL and, and all that, and uh, what was that time like when you were pretty much the only guy in broadcasting working at that point in time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was pretty wild because, uh, you know, for all of us, I, I was working that St. John's Creighton game at, at MSG that ended at halftime back on March 12th. And that was pretty much it. I mean, for three, four months. I mean, I sort of lucked into doing a an, an E-Cup, you know, Rocket League tournament for a month. And that sort of kept me busy for a little while and sort of caught up on some of the pet projects I've wanted to do but have never had the time but eventually you're just sort of jittering to go uh you know the nwsl was the first league uh in the united states to come back from a team uh, sport perspective and so jumped into that with cbs and and vista world link down in in dania beach in florida and uh probably did you know 25 games or so for them but, you know, within two, three weeks, we're already starting USL with, with our ESPN package. So we had something like eight games in 14 days for them. So, you know, for 30 days, it, it was pretty much, you know, at least two games a day. It, it felt like with the occasional off day. And, you know, sometimes you're doing three games in 12 hours and you're just trying to keep your head above water because you're not even in the same league for all of that and and you're just trying to keep up with it but um you know the the toughest thing was you know the the quarantine rules in new york are different than alabama or florida Uh, i'm from ohio certainly different than there it's just i couldn't really come home so once i got down there the season basically ran until november and that's just sort of what it what it took last year and hopefully it won't be the case this year how do you stay sane during all that it's a job we all love to do but i mean i I saw you on the on tv every single day calling soccer games and differently said different leagues and different teams there's so much prep there's so much time that goes into that how do you keep it all together in your head for me uh, i'm very scatterbrained and and it could be tough sometimes but with the tough schedule how do you keep it all together easier said than done I think to a certain extent you have to find ways to decompress a little bit Um, but when it's coming that thick and fast there's really not a lot you can do you really can't give away three hours to watch a movie I mean you just don't have that that luxury at that point in time so um, it it, I I don't know that I really was all that sane. There wasn't a lot of sleeping involved. I never really felt settled during that point in time. But um, at some point, you just have to recognize you're lucky to have a gig at that point in time. And I'm I'm sure you guys know, you know, how tough it was over the summer where it's just kind of, okay, are college sports going to happen? And, you know, when can I realistically expect to see a paycheck outside of what I might be doing right now? I mean, for announcers, that that was a really difficult time. So, you know, a lot of it was, you know, compartmentalizing as best you can. You certainly try and lean on the analysts that, that you get as best you can. So, you know, kudos to Lori Lindsay and Devin Kerr. And, and, you know, for them, it was, you know, I'm just going to try and stay on top of the ball to ball and play by play of it and, and keep the overarching stuff together. And, Sometimes I need to let them carry the load, which on TV is frankly the medium it, it should be to begin with, trying to you know make your analyst as good as you can. So it, it was leaning on a lot of people around me to sort of help me maneuver through that month. And let's go back to March 12th of last year. Just what do you remember at Madison Square Garden, even the day before as the NBA started to shut down, and then everything across sports uh, shut down on March 12th, and you find yourself at the Mecca of basketball, Madison Square Garden, with a microphone in your hand. Yeah. Um, 
to an extent, it feels like yesterday. I, I've heard people say the last year has felt like 100 years. To me, it's sort of gone by in a blank. Uh, you know, this week is the first time MSG is going to have fans, and, and I'll be courtside for the Knicks and the Warriors. You know, New York City hasn't had fans in 11 and a half months. I mean, that's mind-numbing. So, you know, I remember really distinctly walking out the night before and we had sort of made a plan okay it's 500 fans but we're still going to do as full a show as we can make sure everyone stays employed for one more day because we don't know when realistically this could come back it might be two weeks and as we found out it might be four months or longer for a lot of people so you know, the night before, it was a really awkward drive home. Um, you know, one of my best friends, girlfriends works at the garden. She didn't want to take the train home because of the virus. So I drove her home and, you know, we're sort of talking about what this is going to look like in, you know, a day or in a month. And then I went back the next day and it, 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 it felt like a ghost town. And we started getting word about an hour and a half before tip off. Okay. The sec is planning to, to cancel the big 10, the pac 12. And you're sort of starting to hear that everyone's gone down at that point. And we're sitting courtside looking at tweets and social media and the referees come out probably five minutes to tip. And they're talking to the two coaches, um, you know, coach McDermott with Creighton, um, was, was right next to me and they're just sort of looking at each other like are we really about to do this are we about to tip off when no one else is playing so I sort of had a feeling we weren't going to get past the first game I didn't know it was going to be over at halftime until probably the under eight media timeout it became clear in the first half that we were probably going to end it at halftime and I started seeing the copy of it and you know, the, the the crazy thing is, is about a week later, there was the um, one shining moment parody of, you know, all the conferences getting canceled and I was in it. And you're just kind of like, <laughs> this is like the worst one shining moment of all time. So, no, I mean, it, it feels like yesterday. And, and yet I, I still I, I can't wait to, to have fans back and to be at games with with a buzz again because that's why we got into this absolutely and most of this hour we'll talk about obviously your play-by-play -play, television and radio but I am curious about your public address work that you get to do at Madison Square Garden just how did that opportunity come about and what do you love the most about getting to do that uh, for one, I mean, you, you called it the Mecca. I, I, I grew up in Cleveland. I really didn't understand that, that MSG, you know, everyone said world's most famous arena and you kind of blow it off as sort of that New York bluster. And then you find out once you're there, it really is different. Rangers games are different. Knicks games are different. College basketball, the garden is different. You hear it from players, you hear it from fans, you hear it from announcers. It is legitimately different. Um, Mike Walzeski is the 30-year public address announcer for Madison Square Garden. And, you know, they, they've always had a backup for him, but you know, they were looking for maybe someone to fill in on the Liberty or some college games. Um, I was probably a junior in college and, and sent a demo along, which was sort of weird to do in my house, Carmelo Anthony, and you're like, well, you know, everyone I lived with was like, dude, what are you doing in your room? <laughs> Um, but I did it at, at Fordham. Um, Mike's uh, wife is a teacher, and she had one of the Fordham players as a student. Both of them are Fordham alums. So they were at a game, and they were sort of going, okay, th this guy's not too bad. And I started to strike up a, a friendship with Mike. And if not for Wally, you know, there, there's no way I, I'd get that gig. But he sort of, you know, put my name out there and, you know, the, the previous backup moved on from the garden. And it's uh, I, I'm not a big fan of listening to my own voice. I'm not a big fan of um, uh, looking at people while I'm announcing. And, and that's sort of one of those like you have to throw your inhibition away and just be comfortable in front of. 20,000 people just laying it out. So honestly, I, th I think it's it's good to sort of help me build my own confidence a little bit, which I've carried over to, to on air. But it's for me, it's it's more of a passion project. And my passion project just happens to be at MSG. 
And now take me back to your college roots. So you go to Fordham you, and you work at WFUV. Now, for those that don't know, FUV is an acclaimed student radio station. They have a very good signal. I can hear it all the way from northern New Jersey when I'm driving in my car and maybe listening to a Fordham football game or something just to hear other people do games. But what was your experience like there at Fordham? It's, it's a good culture there, isn't it, for the student radio station? I, I knew at some point us announcers would start talking about culture. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the center square on the yes. bingo card. <laughs> Uh, no, it's an awesome culture. It, it, it's sort of one that celebrates, in my opinion, trying to help, you know, the, the masses get better at something uh, together. I mean, it, it's not something where it's a one man band and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that if that's the kind of place you came from. But, you know, there's 50 people in, in the FUV sports department. Not all of them want to be on air. It's, it's the fact that we're credentialed to every you know, professional sports team in New York, you know, you get experience as a beat reporter, you get experience as a producer, you get experience as an announcer. There's a lot of different ways to sort of find yourself there. And so that's one thing. But, you know, I went and visited uh, WFUV uh, when I was a junior in high school. And I, I went in to talk to the SID office and I had made media guides at my high school and it had done a little bit of this in high school, and I knew this is sort of what I wanted to do. And they go, oh, no, you don't want to talk to us. Maybe we can, you know, get you working in other ways, but you want to talk to FUV. I didn't even know that that station was a thing. So I go down there, and they go, okay, Mike Breen and Vin Scully and Michael Kay, uh, Spiro Ditas, Ryan Rucco, those are all Fordham alums, Bob Papa and uh, Chris Carino and, and Mike Yam was was either on Sports Center with NFL Network or Pac-12 Network at that time. You're like, this is unreal. And then you know the 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 piece they resist on is oh, and we get all these people to come in and speak to us. Mike Emmerich and I'm a Penguins fan. I was sold. Like I'm gonna meet Mike Emmerich. This is gonna be awesome. Um, and Bob Aaron's was was my mentor there. He's he's in his 80s now uh, and is retired from FUB. Still one of my, my closest friends and mentors. I love the guy. He sold me on it in, in a multitude of ways. And there's any number of ways you can get into this business. But for me, FUV has been completely invaluable. Do you remember the first time that you hit the air at FUV and what those reps sounded like? Was it a football game, basketball game? Were you able to do football and basketball right away? Or was it like AER at Syracuse where you had to kind of work your way up the ladder? Exactly, exactly. And uh, I'm not going to be offended that I just got referred to AER as like, you know, do you do a big brother? To I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's, we have a little man complex over at FUV. Uh, yeah, trust me. <laughs> um, no, as a freshman, sophomore, no chance you're, you're doing football for the most part. It, it takes the right confluence of events to be able to do that. And I got to call one or two Fordham games. And again, you're on a 50,000 watt NPR affiliate. The expectations in New York um, and, and on an NPR affiliate are a little bit higher than, you know, your run of the mill college station at times. And so I, I probably demoed seven or eight games before I, I finally got on air to actually do one. Um, you know, the first game I called and I've kept it, uh, there's a, a Fordham message board and I, I have I PDF'd it and kept it there was a guy who wrote a five paragraph critique of how poorly I called the game and this it was Fordham at Columbia and uh, in New York we call that the Liberty Cup um, it, it honors victims of the September 11th attacks uh, from both schools um, and Fordham uh, sort of eked it out because Columbia's quarterback ran across the line of scrimmage as he threw either the game tying or the game winning touchdown pass. But he didn't like how I described, you know, pass catchers getting hit because I didn't say what yard line they were on in time. And, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, he's dropped at the 23 and the guy goes, does he mean the ball or does he mean the man? And in the end, a decent amount of it was true. But like, 
I'm 19. I've never done a game on radio. And I'm like, this is what this is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you had to wait a little while. Truth of the matter, I only did two men's basketball games on air while I was at Fordham because I graduated early and we had other more experienced guys ahead of me. So I primarily, you know, worked with the women's basketball team. Um, and I have a ring from that because they were pretty darn good. Um, and then from the soccer perspective, no one wanted to do it. So usually you didn't get on air at all as a freshman. I went and demoed two or three games and listened back to them with, with Bob Aarons. And, you know, they said, okay, this is good enough. You're, you're going with it. And, and I did the streams for that. But even, you know, the first one, and I've, I've told this story before, but, you know, Bob, Bob came and sat next to me. This was before I had even gone through freshman orientation at Fordham. It was like the second day on campus. And I said, hey, I'm going to demo this game, and this is going to be great. And uh, <laughs> it, he, he stopped me like 10 seconds in. It, it, like we, He hit stop on the recorder because I, I went in like, welcome, everybody, to Fordham Women's Soccer. Isn't this great? And, you know, you've got this. He goes, where'd Michael go, and, and who, who are you trying to be? And that was a huge lesson from day one. But I still called my mom crying. Uh, <laughs> I was still confident I had made a big mistake. So, uh, yeah, it, it was sort of rough, I'm sure, to start. Um, I, I was probably a little further along because I sort of made some mistakes in high school and started to get a grip on it. But, yeah, I don't actively seek out what I sounded like, you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and those message boards, what, what Twitter is now is what message yeah. boards were, I guess, back a couple <laughs> years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, except, like, you know, on the message board – you know, it, usually there's a little more nuance to it. I mean, the guy gave legitimate critique. I mean, right. to be fair, during the SEC tournament, I got a really, really rough email from an account that I don't publicize anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, an Arkansas man. And I'm like, dang, it's like the old message boards. I mean, it, it was nuanced, but it was pretty hateful. Right. Uh, uh, whereas Twitter's just hateful and there's very little nuance. Yeah, I had a similar experience uh, when I was a freshman at Tennessee. We did live streaming for an NCAA volleyball. I guess the first two rounds of the tournament, Tennessee lost to San Diego. And then San Diego, I'm sure everyone remembers the Toreros run to the Sweet 16 in volleyball in 2006. Uh, <laughs> well, they course. beat Duke, and I was on the call with you know, one mic. And on volleytalk.com, they thought I was on Quaaludes. So that was my freshman year. You know, some experience getting it's a good one. <laughs> harsh uh, critique on the message boards. So it, it's mean on those streets. But anyway, uh, let's go back uh, to your the mean streets of uh, Ohio for you in St. Ignatius. So what can you tell us? Of, you mentioned some of your broadcast experience there in high school, but we know that's a program that's not only produced you, but John Fanta, also Brendan Gulick. All you guys have done some great work. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing because Brendan basically started this out of nothing. I mean, Brendan Gulick was, I think, two years, maybe three, I think two years older than me. Um, and he went in, you know, to Rory Fitzpatrick's office, who's the assistant AD. Now he's, he's the athletic director at Ignatius and just said, Hey, I want to do this. And this is what it would cost. And it, it's not really, you know, that much of an imposition to do it. And Rory understood it and wanted to give him the opportunity for it. Brendan was actually a really good baseball player too. So when he was sort of done with it, uh, as a you know, first semester senior, he called the football games. As a second semester senior, he made the varsity baseball team. So I jumped in uh, after a not at all career threatening back injury. My talent was career threatening, uh, but I was playing football at the time and sort of decided, okay, I'm going to go try this. And I got the baseball schedule, and, and Bill Schmolt, who was my computer teacher first semester of freshman year, put me in touch with him. And uh, he's now, I think, the, the you know, a, a lacrosse head coach in the OAC um, back in Ohio. But, like, you know, it was a weird confluence of events that made it happen uh, when it did. But Ignatius played one game in May at Progressive Field, the, the home of the Cleveland baseball team. Um, and – that was my goal. I All I wanted to do was to call that game. And if you did enough games along the way and proved you were good enough, I was sure they were going to let me do it. 
And I did. And that was sort of where I fell in love with it, following this baseball team around the, making the, the state final four. I mean, they were really, really good. Um, so Jeff McCormick ran that group for a long time. Um, and, and those guys, you know, and, and John Fanta um, tried out for me in the football uh, film office. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's a really cool lineage that, that's starting to come out of there a little bit. And it's not all on air people. It's um, North Carolina IMG's social media manager came out of that program. Um, you know, there's guys who've gone into SID work. Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool to see how far that's come over the, the course of the last 10 to, oh my God. Yeah. It's 10 years. <laughs> Funny to think about for all of us. Um, so you're at Fordham, you're able to get all these reps, you're able to work with Bob uh, what were some things he helped you with the most and how'd you start to take some first steps away from campus and really, uh, start your professional journey? Yeah, I think part of it was sort of giving me the confidence to, to go on air and, and let it rip. Uh, it, I don't know that I'm the most technically gifted broadcaster. I'd actually go as far as to say I'm far from it. Um, I feel the game a lot more than I see the game a lot of the time, right or wrong. And it's something I've tried to work on, you know, sharpening some tools, but um, I also don't want to lose who I am. I used to put up highlights of um, <laughs> I get excited sometimes part one through seven was the Fordham football season <laughs> uh, my, my junior year because, I mean, it's just like I would just go totally off the rails. So he'd, he'd work with me on trying to find the appropriate sort of energy level of specific moments. He certainly, you know, tick the boxes of the very most literal technical things you know, Michael, what are you actually seeing in this moment? I don't see anything horizontally as to where this guy's moving. I, I need to hear time and score and down and distance. Um, time and score every time the chains move down and distance before every single snap. I want to see what the formation looks like. I want to hear it in different ways. I don't want you to, to say exactly the same thing, even though you've seen the same formation five times in a row. And at times we would see that, um, you know, with a variety of plays out of it. So, uh, you know, a lot of it's that, a lot of it's, um, you know, sort of teaching me how to, how to vet things the right way, how to tell stories more concisely. I, I owe that man, uh, I, I have an agent and this agent won't enjoy the fact that I'm saying I probably owe Bob 10% too. <laughs> So I want to I want to touch base on the vocal side of it. it you mentioned the energy and, and getting that right, but it, it's so hard for young broadcasters to to get to that conversational tone, to not sound like Joe Broadcaster, right? How long did it take you? And maybe you're still searching for your voice. I know I'm still searching for mine, to where you got to a point where you're comfortable. You're like, okay, yeah, this it sounds like Mike Watts on the air. This doesn't sound like an imitation that Mike Watts is doing of a broadcaster. Well, it's tough because I'm just trying to sound like Kyle Crooks. No, oh, that's that's tough. <laughs> that's your first problem. <laughs> your first um, problem. I, you know, I, th I think we're all sort of looking for it. Um, the thing about me is, is when my energy gets higher, I tend to get into that into that range where you're kind of like, is he telling me about a sporting event or is he selling me a used 1975 Camaro? Yeah. And that's sort of the line I, I don't want to pass. But... Um, I, I, I'll try and hit a lower note if I feel like I'm getting too excited because I feel like that's more my range. I, I think that's something Al Michaels does tremendously well in big moments. You know, you'll, you'll hear him go, you know, it's caught touchdown, you know, and it's, it's just like, get yourself back into the range that you want to be in as opposed to breaking over the top and eventually, you know, I, I do like 230 games a year. This voice can only do so much. It ends up cracking. Like, I know that's going to happen. So from an energy perspective, I'm trying to stay within that range. But also, you know, I'll come into games and sometimes it's, hey, you need more energy here. And I'm going, no, I'm, I'm cognitively trying to, to get my voice right from the first first syllable I say on air. 
And and that's when I when I'm really jacked, I'll try and start from a, a lower register to try and work into my tone rather than to start where I think my tone is and end up being three, five, ten rungs too high. And I think there's a few sports where you can really build that conversational tone. That's that's baseball, that's softball, and that's soccer. And you call a lot of soccer. You're the lead guy on SEC Network, and I get to see you a lot, which uh, you're at the SEC tournament every year. I know Roger saw you this year. But that's that's a sport that if you do that enough, right, Mike, that you can – that builds the basis of that conversational tone and you being you when you're calling a soccer game because there's – I mean, I, I like soccer, but at times there's not a whole lot going on in terms of scoring. It's a lot of plotting and, and storytelling, right? Yeah, no, it is. Uh, it, it It's interesting because I, I think a lot of people view soccer because it's so free-flowing. There's so much, uh, you know, there's such a difference in the, the number of quantifiable events that occur, you know, to, to the amount of time you're actually working. There's a, a play every 40 seconds guaranteed in a football game. In a basketball game, you're guaranteed something will happen theoretically within 30 seconds every time up the floor. So you're sort of regimented that way. I think soccer sort of gives you a chance to work on that conversational tone, understand when to get in and out as appropriate. And I, I honestly, I think it's, it's the perfect sort of fireside chat approach leading into the final third. So the, the first two thirds of the field, for the most part, you know, you really can sort of find your level and try to stay there. Um, for, for me, that's been a lot of fun to be able to explore that more and more over the years as I get a better understanding for the game and when I have those moments to dive into it. And I think it's carried over to football and basketball and baseball and softball and so on in different ways as I've tried to find a way to weave in and out of those defined moments where you know there's going to be action by getting back into that more conversational tone that soccer invites you to have so it's it's certainly a different sport but i do find that it's it's helped me find that tone a little bit better yeah and was soccer something that was really on your radar as a path you wanted to go down or did you start to get some early opportunities that led you to more tv uh, soccer opportunities yeah, it's a little bit of both because when I went to high school, you know, St. Ignatius, I think, has won 11 football championships. In Ohio, they have historically been the gold standard. But when I was there, and it continues now, the soccer program was a, a national championship contender at the high school level every year. So I didn't know anything about soccer. I hadn't gone to an indoor game at the Cleveland Crunch. I had never watched a Columbus crew game, nothing. I, I grew up in a in a Cleveland, you know, major league sport house. That's what we did. I didn't follow Columbus or whatever. So for, for me, it, it was, okay, a bunch of my friends are playing. It's our best team right now. I'm going to give it a shot. And then I go to Fordham and no one wants to do it. And you have a first round pick in the MLS Super Draft the following year playing out his senior year as a goalkeeper. Um, and you've got probably three or four other all-conference guys. I mean, they were in a position to potentially win a championship in the A-10. So you go, okay, this is pretty cool. I'm going to jump into this, and it's my first ticket on air. And then I started to meet some people along the way. J.P. Della Camera has been great. Uh, Michael Cullen has produced so many Olympics and World Cups over the years and and has gotten me a lot of places that that i couldn't have imagined um you know these are guys who came and spoke at fordham and i started to pick their brands a little bit and when i came out of school first game i did was the usl championship final in rochester so that's my first freelance gig and then the following spring i, I was on the inaugural mycfc on yes broadcast as a sideline reporter um, that was sort of my first foray in the door and, you know, credit to them for letting a young guy get a shot and that's opened doors to other things to sort of allow me to diversify a little bit more. But, you know, it, it's soccer's an interesting place to be when the American accent isn't necessarily the most prevalent, 
but we'll we'll see where it takes me. Right now, I, I really enjoy it, and this is sort of, you know, be where your feet are, right? I, I just want to give a quick shout out though. You work with Matt Stubbington, who who balances the accents. Uh, Stubbs. Stubbington, Roger, if you don't know, he's the one I work I with on SEC Plus at Florida. So oh, he's okay. an outstanding just English <laughs> accent. I had to get up to Charlotte and then to, uh, I guess it'd be Raleigh-Durham for the ACC conference final. And the only way to do that, to make those flight connections, was to take a 430 out of Orlando. And Matt Stubbington was was so kind drove me to orlando after our 10 o'clock game and i got there about 35 minutes before the flight took <laughs> off i i slept for like half of it he was listening to some really uh really enlightening movie podcasts which you may or may not know about kyle oh, yeah. i've taken the long trip with matt and the guy is the guy is a prince as He's we all know. yeah 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 <laughs> That's really good. And you did a nice job of breaking down some like soccer play by play prep and strategies uh, and a moment ago. But just what have you learned more about the sport? Kind of the deeper you get into it and going back and forth between some college work, professional work, all the different leagues you cover. For one, these fans know what they're watching. These fans um, will know if you don't know what what you're watching and they can be certainly, you know, the expectations are high. Um, they can be tough and you, you sort of have to go in understanding that. So from a preparation standpoint, you, you can't be wrong consistently. You have to get pronunciations right. It is a much more uh, diverse uh, sport from a nationality perspective than, you know, the NFL. It, it just is. It's not to say there isn't that diversity in the NFL, but, you know, you'll call games with, you know, 11 starters from seven different countries. And that that's not at all surprising. And you're supposed to get all the names right. And that's, to be fair, has always been our job. So, you know, it's not a complaint, but you need to go in and, and, and know that stuff first. And if you can't get that right, you're going to have a really rough go with it. Um, beyond that, it, it's not as simple as saying, oh, that's a defender. There is so much more nuance to it than the most basic level we can look at. And that doesn't mean you can't call the game without that nuance. But as you continue to progress, you want to improve that nuance over time. Um, you know, the, the tough thing off monitor, which a lot of us are learning, it's hard to see the whole field. Um, you know, it's, it's such a free flowing game. People move in and out of positions as the game goes along, that kind of stuff to, to understand what you're looking at takes a little bit of time and a little bit of effort and a little bit of study. So all that sort of comes with it too. Um, it, it, yeah, it's a unique sport and it's not one that for a lot of Americans is, you know, top of mind. So you have to make the effort to understand it at some capacity, maybe not as well as, you know, college football or as well as, you know, basketball, but you need to find a way to, to really be on top of your game uh, or, or you will 100% be found out. So let's transition. How does, how does the Cincinnati opportunity come about with the, with the Bengals preseason television voice of the Bengals? So that's, that's a big jump. Obviously, a lot of people watch those games. It's the NFL. It's a very rare group that gets to call NFL games. So how did that opportunity come about and, and how has it been? Has it been two years, Mike, calling the, the Bengals games? Obviously, you didn't get to do them this year, but has it been two seasons you've done it? Yeah, did two seasons, did not do the third. And actually, because of a close contact, I ended up doing radio, filling yeah. in for them a couple times this year. So I thought I was out of the NFL game, but <laughs> helped me back in. Um, it, it, honestly, it's still a, l a little surreal for me. Um, Brad Johansson had, had moved on to Raleigh Durham. He had been their longtime TV voice. And uh, I, I knew it was open, but I didn't think I had any chance to get it. I mean, I used E3 college football tape from the FCS playoffs. I mean, that that was what I used to, to get that gig from a here's what I can do for you perspective. Um, you know, I had heard through Ryan Rucco, actually, that the job was open. 
Um, Ryan Rucco's got connections with the NFL and he had heard that and they sort of passed my tape along to, you know, Brian Sells and Dave Ashbrock at the Bengals. Dave is the producer. Brian Sells is, is the vice president of the team. And, uh, you know, I got a call one morning and this will be news to them if they find out about it here. But, uh, you know, like I had done a 10 p.m. game finished around 1230, drove two hours up to Palm Beach where I was staying at the time doing Remy's in Florida. So I got in at three, I probably got the call at 915. Man, I was like completely asleep in my underwear and I get a call from a Cincinnati number and I'm like, okay, that was my interview for the gig. <laughs> um, thank God it wasn't Zoom. Um, so... <laughs> So that was my first interview with them. And, and then they said, okay, you know, we'll keep you in mind. And I probably didn't hear for about a month. Um, I didn't know that Dave had reached out to a really good friend of mine who, who's produced a lot of my SEC soccer stuff, who's become one of my best friends in this business, and Todd Coolis. They're both from the Cincinnati area. They both, you know, cut their teeth there. So one person knows another, and you wouldn't think they're connected, but they are. Um, and said, hey, you know, th this guy's going to give you the real effort. Like, he's, he's really going to put it all into this. The other thing I thought was really useful was we had Mike Valpredo and the Anthony Munoz on that broadcast already. They were just looking to fill the third spot. Those guys have been there for years, and they're great at what they do. Moon is a Hall of Famer. Uh, he, he's an absolute prince of a person. Valpredo was so good to me when I first came in, and we stayed in touch. Um, I, I just said, look, I just want to be a traffic cop. That That's my philosophy on broadcasting at this level right now. I'm going to come in. I'm going to give you as much research as I can. I'll come to training camp and talk with some of the players. I'll prep as hard as I can. And I, I will understand this franchise and this team and, and tell these fans why they want to watch. Um, all the while sort of bringing the best out of those two. And I think that resonated a little bit. I wanted to be part of that team. I told them how I felt I could help that team. And, yeah, I do think that resonated. So dream come true. Still can't believe it happened. I, I, I was driving from Palm Beach to Fort Lauderdale and pulled over on the side of the road when I got that call because it was just such a – it it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up still. And when you think about some of the hardest assignments to prepare for, not that there's a lack of information, but the amount that you have to prepare for an NFL preseason game, the depth charts are about eight deep. And especially before cuts and all of that, it is the first couple have to be a bear because you're not seeing any of the stars. How do you handle the amount of story? That's when you get the most human interest on a football game is preseason television. You don't necessarily get him in the regular season game. So how did you handle the, the prep of that type of game? Cause there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. It's, it's something where you want to be ready for everyone, but you, you also don't want to have, you know, 13 stories on everybody. You got to okay. be selective. So that's step one. I mean, I get the preseason schedule right after the draft. So early May, so when they first promote it, I'm looking at, at the depth chart then and just going, okay, I think our lads is the one that, that puts it out all off season long. And it's, it's not perfect, but you basically know who's under contract and, and who the rookies are. I'll do the first, you know, I'll do the Bengals and I'll do the first week or so, um, maybe dip into the second week. And yeah, some of that stuff may go to the cutting room floor, but in August, I think I've only flown in the day before the game out of my 10 Bengals preseason games or 10 total games uh, over the, the past three years. I think I've flown in the day before twice total. So I've had a game the night before. I don't, I don't have time to do all of it the week of for 180 players. It, it's just not possible. I'll go to training camp. That really helps. The first time I went into the locker room, and I've been in pro locker rooms, but you still kind of go, God, what am I doing here? You know, it doesn't feel right. I mean, I'm watching A.J. Green play ping pong, and he's actually very good at it. But, like, what is going on, man? Um, so, 
you, you just try and find your footing. Dan Horde, who's a Q's guy and a, again, a, a great human being, sort of took me by the hand a little bit and walked me around the room. And Dave Lapham did it as well and helped me out that first couple of times I was in to help me get my footing. But, you know, talking with some of the guys, Matt Barkley was really good. Um, and, and Dan sort of walked me up to him, did his and said, hey, this is Mike. Can you chat with him? Because he was the backup quarterback and he was going to play two quarters. He was really helpful. Um, you know, the one thing that stood out to me during my time there um, in preseason was all the rookies were really good about this stuff. Um, Michael Jordan, I, I have a good story I've never told about you know, what it's like growing up with the name Michael Jordan, um, the, the former Ohio State offensive lineman, and Quentin Flowers, who I, I know a lot of people in the Southeast certainly know from, from his time playing college ball. His background story um, that he told me, and we had about two minutes on air, the end of the third quarter, where they were running the ball with him constantly, and I knew the end of quarter break would sort of give a – a chance for us to find our levity going into the fourth. But the, the people he's lost in his life and the people who helped him through it, um, that's the best storytelling I've ever done on air because he gave me so much and opened himself up so much. And I, I don't know what he's doing right now, but I hope he's doing well because he was such a good guy. Uh, but that was – year one being in that locker room and you're just trying to get people to establish a little bit of trust with you. And what can you tell us, you mentioned the storytelling aspect of it just, and you also talked about being a traffic cop on a television broadcast. Just how do you try to be the best teammate as possible towards your color analyst, but also your producer and director and make sure everybody's going in the same direction. I lead in with most of my new producers saying, look, I'm going to want to fit 10 pounds into a five pound bag. So you got to tell me when I'm, when I'm over the line, when I'm asking for too much and I'll get there. Trust me. I've, I've had producers that have worked with a lot say, Mike, this ain't getting into this show today. You need to pick a different show where we have less to go on, but this ain't the time. Um, and there's other times where you kind of got to stand on the table and go, look, this is really important to me. We, we really need to make this happen. Um, and sometimes our interests align and sometimes they don't. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the best piece of storytelling we did in the SEC tournament was Tara Katz's mom, uh, who was battling stage four cancer, plays for Tennessee, had played a really good season, was playing a rivalry game. And she had put off chemo to be there in Orange Beach. And that mattered a lot to me. So I was down 20 minutes to air going, hey, can you please point her out so we can show her on camera? We confirm that it was okay with Tara, with her mom. You know, we tried to put a lot of work into getting that right and, and to get the tone of that right because it mattered to us. It was a huge story for Tara and for that team. And that mattered to us. So... You know, with producers, I think it's all about, you know, what can you realistically expect of one another? And then saying, hey, look, if I'm doing something wrong, get my ear. Like, I can take that criticism even if we're on air. Hey, Mike, can you shut up, please? Oh, okay. Um, or this is where our replay angles are coming from. Some producers tell you, some don't. Some are more vocal, some aren't. And I'll say, look, you know, how do you want to do this if I haven't worked with someone before? Um, you, you try and, you know, on set days, if you're there, go to the truck, see what they're working on, be appreciative, but also be inquisitive and have a sharp eye. Um, know what you're looking for. Be willing to send things ahead of time and, and get ahead to help your production team. From an analyst perspective, I, I, I'll lay out the, the most basic thing. Hey, just so you know, we haven't worked together on a goal call. I will usually lay out for five, 10 seconds after that initial call, and I'll either tag it ahead of the replay, her third of the year, uh, their you know, fifth goal in six games, uh, the biggest goal of Tennessee's season, or I'm just gonna lay out, but once the replay comes in, it's yours. Just give me those 10 seconds to, to establish what just happened. And also, you know, when we get into the final third, there's going to be a crescendo there, and we don't want to get caught. Um, if I'm talking too much, pinch me. 
If there's something you want to talk about, write it down, tell me, you know, let, let's figure this out um, so that I can make you shine the best I can. Um, I'm pretty irreverent on air. I, I really try and keep it loose. Um, and, and then, you know, from a analyst perspective, from someone that even I have worked with a lot of the time, I'll say, tell me three things you think about team X. Tell me three things you think about Florida. Um, you know, I, I think they're an elite passing team. I think they haven't done a, a good enough job finishing. Um, I think the young players on this team are exciting. Those are three things I'm confident they want to talk about during the show now. And so that, even if I don't know the analyst well, will give me three different avenues to tee something up for them. Then how often do you use talkback during the game? I imagine it's a lot with producers you're comfortable with, you're working with over and over again, but how do you try to use that to help uh, the rest of the broadcast? I know one national announcer who actually talks more crap on talkback <laughs> than you would ever imagine. And I've heard <laughs> I have heard so many stories and my biggest fear is, is I'm going to hit the spare box yep. instead of the play by play. Box. <laughs> that happened for my analyst once, by the way, <laughs> she said something like I'm scared of this coach. And she said it on the air as opposed to <laughs> into the right box. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Uh, um, talk back a ton, a ton. It, it depends on um, what we're doing. I'll also say to a director, hey, I may say white 35, and you may not be able to get to that player, but that's a player who's playing well or a story that is relevant to that moment, and I'm trying to give them a heads up. So, um, you know, the player, you know, in the white jersey number 35 is easier for a director, most likely, than to give a name because they aren't thinking in that context. Um, and it's easier for camera people who are probably listening to that feed to be able to pick up, you know, where we want to go next. And it, it's not something where I'm trying to direct the show myself, but, you know, especially when you start to know directors better, you can start to work in concert that way. So talk back a lot with that, you know, I'll hit, um, talk back maybe once every 10 minutes. Hey, is there a graphic we want to get in here? Uh, hey, I think this graphic would be a good fit. Hey, do you want to tell this story now? You know, if we're doing promos, you know, you know, he may go, hey, let's go now. And I see the goalkeepers moving fast to take a goal kick. I'll go, not yet. Um, and, and so we'll work in concert that way all through talkback. And uh, I think a, a lot of people who aren't in our profession probably don't even recognize it's going on. At least that's the goal. Uh, it's not so obvious that we're like plotting this out in real time as opposed to having like a bigger plan. And I need to know, what's your key to on-camera opens? I, I've tried to get better at them over the years. I think I have gotten better at them, gotten a little bit more relaxed. I think that comes with doing anything over and over. But for you, being it's just not natural. That, that two-minute open sometimes is just you're, you're standing there like sardines next to Now you wouldn't be standing next to each other, but <laughs> you got awkward hand gestures. You're looking at the camera. You're looking at your analyst. How do you? How much do you think about what you're going to say? Do you have bullet points in your mind? Do you script out when you know the the scene set when you come on? How how do you do those opens? Yeah, I don't do any really any scripting anymore. I may write a note about a player. Um, you know, I did the USL final a couple of years ago in Didier Drogba. That was his last pro game, and in pro soccer, I mean, he's a he's a legend, a god. Um, so, you know, 21 trophies last game. So, yeah, I, I held on to it almost like a security blanket, more so than actually needing it. I, I had done the prep. I knew it. But you also don't want to get tongue-tied or lose your mind as soon as you come on camera. Um, you've also got someone in your ear going, okay, we're, you know, Drogba, Spencer, fans, you're on, um, to sort of keep you moving in a way that at times, you know, look, you can do this as much as you want, but it could still sort of make you go, huh, uh, in a way that makes you lose your, your track. Um, Al Michaels, I've noticed, every Sunday night football in maybe it's 2017, was always, you know, you know, downtown Indianapolis on this third weekend of September as Andrew Luck and the Colts take on Baker Mayfield and the Browns on Sunday night football. That's it. 
There was no creative limerick. There was no haiku that he did. Uh, it was like really, really basic, but with his tone and his inflection and the way that he, uh, the gravitas that, that he carries, the way he brings you into the show, it still feels big and you didn't need to come up with three things that rhymed. You, you just sort of laid it out there for people. And I'm sure I got all the names wrong there. Maybe Luck was retired. Maybe Baker was still a Sooner. I have no idea. But you get the, the concept. I mean, he did that for an entire season. And I kept, you know, looking because they're all online somewhere. You know, how does he do it? Because I, I think he does a great job. But the God honest truth, Kyle, uh, I still feel completely like a fish out of water. I'm glad you said sardine because I do. I feel like a fish <laughs> out of water every time I do an on-camera open. I'm never going to feel entirely comfortable. Um, I, I'm not comfortable with, you know, slathering on makeup or, you know, I, I don't prefer shirt and tie as my go-to um, way of dress. Uh, it, it's it's sort of a necessary evil to an extent. It's still a visual medium, uh, but I I don't feel comfortable. I haven't felt comfortable, and I'm starting to get a little bit better at it, but it, it, it it's never going to feel like, oh, yeah, of course, my favorite part of the show. Like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but we also spend an hour working on two minutes, right? That's right. You think so much about the two minutes that, that is so inconsequential. Well, it's not inconsequential. It does set up the broadcast, but the average viewer doesn't really give a damn about it for the most part. <laughs> right. Or they miss it, you know. <laughs> okay, right. Or they, they tune in late. Oh, yeah. It's a 706 first pitch. I'm going to ignore the open. 706. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> while all of us are like, you know, sending this in for like local Emmy consideration. Right, like... right, right. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me ask you about your boards. Uh, I think I've seen them when you've come and, and you've done soccer, but... How do you how do you structure everything? How do you have it in a place where you can find it right away? Yeah, so basketball um, and soccer are entirely numbers. I oftentimes don't find when I'm looking for something, whether it be a fact or just if I've gone blank on a name, that I'm looking for. Oh yeah, that sub. It's no, I'm I'm looking for a number. I'm, I'm thinking a number and I need a name. So I've found that that's easier even for soccer. When everyone gets forward on a corner kick, you're talking eight, nine people all within 15 yards. I'm not thinking, let me find this center back. I'm thinking, let me find this number as fast as I can. So I've found that that's easier for me. Soccer, primarily people go with labels uh, and put them in formation. That's certainly what the greats do, and far be it for me to tell them otherwise. Whereas uh, basketball, I've seen it done a, a variety of different ways, whether it be starters, subs, by leading scorer, um, however you want to do it um, is is totally fine. Baseball, I, I actually just have a Word document where I put um, – you know, the, the previous games line up um, in order with sort of uh, it, it's super basic the way I, I put it together. But I've done limited baseball in the past. I'm sure I could do more of a board style, but I it's such a loose thing that I haven't really felt necessary. Football, I certainly go by formation because the size of a D lineman and the size of a safety is so obvious that I know where to look, but also the numbers 50s are linebackers, 40s are linebackers, 20s and 30s and 10s are secondary, 80 and up, you're, you're talking about defensive linemen, same thing on offense, for the most part, tight ends are in the 80s, uh, you know, skill players, you know, ones and 10s and 80s are, are your wide receivers, running backs are 20s and 30s, like, it, it's not that hard to you know, I, I see the game so clearly with that that's unnecessary. But, yeah, boards are a little bit different for each one. And then it's just I, I try and have my top nugget, you know, that throwaway line when you introduce a guy. Joe Mixon led the AFC in rushing yards after week eight in 20, what, 19. Um, you know, that was my initial throwaway line on Joe Mixon for a while. Um, Andy Dalton – you know, led the Bengals to the playoffs five years and is currently on the last year of his deal. So you try and find varied ways to, you know, either tell the story of the guy or why this game is important to that guy. 
um, just to have top of mind. That's usually the first thing you'll see with a player on my boards. Let's talk about demo reels, and you've gotten a lot of your jobs, I'm sure, because of a strong demo, and that's, you know, Kyle and I both trying to move into television more. We're all worried about the reel and how it looks and how it's organized. Just kind of what's your philosophy on how it should be organized uh, for a different sport and how long should it be? Should it be a lot of stand-ups, not many, game highlights, storytelling? Just how do you try to have it set up? Yeah, I've sort of found that it's a, it's a moving target. Different people see it different ways. I've had a, a coordinating producer at Fox flat out tell me, buddy, I, if, you're, if you have my email, I know you can do a highlight. I want to see everything else. I've had people at ESPN go, hey, you really need to blow me away from the outset. You may only get 30 seconds. Put your highlights up front. So I've found like there is no perfect way to get your, your demo reel watched or to have it land just right with a certain coordinating producer or producer, whoever you send it to. Um, I, I obviously put your best stuff, you know, first, you know, it, it, genuinely, I do believe you have about 30 seconds to make a connection before eventually they've got 100 other demos to look at. So I'll try and put maybe the first 10, 15 seconds of an on-camera or some highlights uh, and then go into a game clip and maybe on the backside I'll, I'll put a couple more things in there and just sort of like leave a table of contents, so to speak, to let people decide what they want to see. But, you know, I, I've sort of taken to shock and awe is, is the best way to go because if you only have 30 seconds, you really should try and impress from the get-go. But... Uh, I've just come to find out there is no perfect way to get people to be interested in your work. I, 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 if there was a better way, trust me, I'd be, I'd be calling, you know, SEC football already, but uh, there isn't. <laughs> and you said that you do have an agent, right, Mike? So how much does that help? Do you, when would you say that, uh, advise somebody to, to try and, and search for an agent? Is it something that's completely necessary? Is it something only for certain people at a certain level in the industry that, that need an agent? Well, at what point do you think people should, should look into that, do you think? Yeah, I think realistically, if you think the next step for you is to kick the door down, you're already in the door, the next step is to kick it down, and you need need a little bit of help to get over that hump. I think that's where you start to talk about an agent, um, you know, I had thought about it for a few years. I had talked to a handful. Some just didn't like me, and that's okay. Uh, some did. Um, you know, there were probably three or four that I had spoken to at length and and had potential to sort of, you know, go that route. Uh, I had met Sean Wyman while he was still at ESPN, working in their talent office uh, for coffee up in Bristol. Um, in December of 2019 and then he left to become an agent in February or March of 2020 at Max Entertainment and then the pandemic so he walked right into that one uh, but I signed with him in July I you have to find someone that that you're genuinely friendly with um, you know I, I did the Knicks and the Bucks He's a huge Milwaukee Bucks fan, and I sent him a picture of Giannis sitting on the scorer's table. That was cool for both of us, for sure. Um, you know, I'll chat with um, him about all kinds of things. If I see random news, he's following the same stuff I am, but he goes, oh, yeah, I knew about that two weeks ago, and I, I've been working on it. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's why I read the New York Post. You you know, have a job doing this. So, you know, for me, it, it's not for everybody. Um, if you can do it on your own, God bless you. I mean, I, I, I went in alone for about five years and look, I mean, you know, I, I've been comfortable enough. It's, it's not like, you know, the difference between me making dinner is whether or not I had an agent, but do I find that he has a better grip on, sort of the internal politics and what's opening up at different times and connections and friends in good places than I do. Yeah. Does it help that he was in the ESPN baseball league for a long time? Yes, it does. Um, he knows everybody and everyone will give him a call back. And to me, that was important at this point in time. So took the plunge and 
uh, Sean watches everything. So, Sean, what up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly good. Roger and Kyle say hello. Um, yes. so, hello, Sean. <laughs> hello. Let me get a little deeper. Hello. Um, as we wrap things up, Mike, uh, what can you tell us just about the pros and cons of being a freelancer and uh, kind of the ups and downs? Obviously, we mentioned all the different events you have, but just what do you love the most about it? And for anybody that's considering going the freelance TV route, what should they keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, the tough thing from a freelance perspective is, is you don't know anyone anything and they don't know you anything. So from a really simple perspective in what I'm doing right now, the, the NBA, as we're speaking, has not put out the second half schedule for their season. I don't know when I'm working for them. I'm the backup for them. So I'm working off, you know, the, the go-to guy's dates. So first the schedule needs to come. Then I need to find out when I can work. All the while I have people saying, hey, I really need to know your availability for March. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, so... You know, like step one, you want to take work that's local to you. It's important to me to have work in New York City because this is where I live and I get to go home at the end of the night. And my fiance uh, will end up losing me from like March to November again when I'm traveling constantly. So I'm trying to enjoy time around her while I can. Um, so that's frustrating. Uh, keeping track of your own business, invoices, um, you know, I got a finance degree at Fordham. So for me, you know, taxes and uh, do you want to do a SEP IRA and are you covered by a 401k plan at this place? I mean, you know, you're trying to figure out all that stuff and you don't necessarily need to go that deep in the weeds. But if this is your business, you know, a lot of the time it can be really helpful to figure out what's, you know, what, what makes sense in terms of your own personal finances. Um, I, it... <laughs> You know, taxes are a dumpster fire. I worked for nine or 10 different people last year. And, you know, some people are really good about sending your 1099 and some aren't. Um, so scheduling is tough. Uh, trying to make sure you don't over schedule in a way that puts you in trouble. Um, you know, I've gotten to a game 20 minutes to air, um, got out of my car, went inside, put on a tie and instantly pre-tape my open. Um, that was not great um, because I had to fly morning of and one of the plane's tires blew out um, before we got on the plane. I'm much happier it happened then, but at least if it happened once I was already there, I could get off. Uh, so <laughs> uh, struggles in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, so <laughs> these, these boys get it. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it, it's just, it, it's a constant chaotic agent of being a freelancer and you want to keep striving to do bigger stuff by the same token. I am loyal to a fault. I will run through a brick wall to make things work for people who've been good to me. Um, and sometimes that can get you in trouble too. So it, it's a, uh, it's a tug of war and it's a pretty constant one at that. Well, Mike, we have really enjoyed this past hour uh, getting to pick your brain about all things, not only soccer, but the Bengals, television, just everything. It's been a lot of fun. Just thank you for your time and your insights, and we hope to see you in person at some SEC events coming up soon. Yeah, I'm hoping so. I missed Gainesville. I, 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 I think I only got to do one game, and it was off-site there. Uh, so that's disappointing. Uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get back to Tuscaloosa, get to Gainesville soon enough. But thank you guys for having me. This was awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming on. All right. Our thanks to Mike Watts and thanks to all of you for watching Broadcaster Hour.